Hey, today I've named it Parade Sunday. I realize you're used to a different terminology on this day, but too bad I've renamed the day. Why? Because there's a parade today, that's why. What, what, what? That was a crazy question. Like, uh, there's a parade today. I mean, it's not every day you get to celebrate the national championship, right? Now, I do have to share a funny story about the whole national championship thing. So as it happens, you know, it, it, you know KU wins. And, um, and here's another note. For you that are K-State fans in the room, I know you watched the second half of the game. Because you saw the first half of the game. And you were thinking, oh, this is going to be good to watch go down. Too bad. Okay, so we won. And so then, <laughs> so I, I get on my work chat and I post it because what that meant was if KU won the national championship, I won the company bracket because I never choose against my team. I've been disappointed a few times, um, but beyond that, I, I, so I post this picture in our company chat. Rock, chalk, champs. Forgetting we're an international company, one of my Australian friends says, Steve, you've lost me on this one. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and my response was, that's okay. No one around here knows what it means either. <laughs> right? Rock chalk. I mean, who understands? I, and first of all, okay, now I, I get it. It's not even a real bird. So the chant to, like, you know, Jayhawks, I don't know, whatever. So it's great. I went there. It's cool. Like, there's a parade today. And I realize parades are fun when you win championships. And I realize around here, championships have not been plentiful. But over the last few years, it's, things have changed a little, right? I mean, think about this. We had the dry spell for the Royals from 85 to 2015. And my math's pretty decent, so that's 30 years. We had the Chiefs from 1970 to 2020. Yeah, that math is pretty good too. That's a real easy round number. 50. Yikes. Jayhawks a little bit better. 88, 2008, 2022. You really want to push into the local sports arena Washburn basketball, men's championship, 1987, nonsense. I just want to point out, I was in school at Washburn the last time they won a national championship. I was also in school during KU's national championship, but I was no longer a student at KU. But uh, the women, at least, of Washburn have won in 2005, right? I mean... Now, now, I have to do this because, like, you cannot speak at Mission Hill without a soccer reference, okay? I just, I thought that was in the requirements of the speaking code of Sunday mornings. So, Sporting Kansas City, again, they changed their name in there too, but they have a lot of wins. They do. The MLS Cup, they won in 2000 with a different name, different branding, and then in 2013. But... They've also won the U.S. Open Cup in 2004, 2012, 2015, and 2017. Hopefully I got my things right. Now, some of you not soccer fans, you're going, wait a minute, how do they get two chances at championships every year? That's just soccer, the way soccer does it, right? They, they create these things. They get extra championships to win every year. But anyway, I, I realize that is not what we came to talk about. But parades are cool. Right? Everybody loves a parade. And, and, you know, with championships come expectations. Right now that, you know, in, in previous to a few years ago, Chiefs fans were like, we're not going to win. Now there's an expectation. And evidently there was an expectation and a realization for the other teams in the AFC West that if they want to make the playoffs, they better get better. Now it looks ugly in the AFC West. Just, that's just me looking at things. But 
When you look at it, the Royals, that's another story, although, take note, they are in first place in the division. And they're only 2-0, and oh, but whatever. All right. So that brings us back to the parade and expectations, right? This parade and this parade, this day of the parade, uh, like parades are cool and we're going to talk about a parade. And the reason I'm calling it a parade is because we're talking about Luke chapter 19 and there is no mention of palm branches. Ah, I even saw Ed go. There are no mention by Luke about palm branches on this day. I realize the other writers do, but Luke does not. There's a reason why Luke doesn't, because he's writing to a different crowd. There's a few things he leaves out that he doesn't mention because it'd be confusing to his readers. He's writing to a different group of people. So anyway, there's no mention of palm branches, and so I decided I'll rename the day, because it is a day for a parade called Parade Sunday. It's no longer called Palm Sunday this year. It's called Parade Sunday, okay? Just work with me, okay? But there's a lot that goes on before this parade that Jesus is a part of. And some things that happen as Jesus gets closer to Jerusalem, he, he begins giving directions to his people about his parade. <laughs> Jesus knows exactly where he's headed. He, he knows where he's going. He knows the parade route. He, he knows how this thing is going to end. But most, if not all, the people have no idea. And this takes place in the lead up to Passover, right? So if you're familiar with that, people are, are, are coming to Jerusalem. Just like they're going to go to, to Mass Street today, they're going to gather with an expectation that something's going on. And so they're, the, the people in Jerusalem and the people from around the area are all gathering towards Jerusalem for Passover. They're coming for a reason. They, they do this annually, do this on a regular basis. And, and, and the, the song that we sang there, you know, about religious tradition and, and all those things. It's important to see that because this is here. They, they were following a normal religious tradition. They were doing the things they do. And Jesus has a different th plan for this Passover. And God's plan is something different. And so, so for the parade today, there's been, you know, announcements and social media posts and, and segments on the news that this is going to happen. There was none of that in Jesus' day. It's a simple crowd of travelers headed to Jerusalem or being in Jerusalem for the Passover. And so Luke 19, verse 28, starts this way. After telling the story, Jesus went on towards Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. As he came to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them, as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying that colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. So they went and found the colt just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the, owner, the owners asked them, why are you untying that colt? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. And here we learn the disciples made preparations. And we see that, that Jesus told them, that he gives pretty specific instructions. He told them what to get, where to find it, and what to say. Now, there, there's, some, there's some interesting thoughts there that we, we can also work with that parallel and understand that Jesus is going to speak to us. And he's going to tell us what to get, where to find it, and what to say. Look, again, he told his disciples, he sent them on a mission uh, work when he was teaching them and instructing them, look, don't worry about what to say. The Holy Spirit will give you words. Right? And I think we need to have some confidence. But, but on the surface, this looks like a crazy request. Uh, there's actually not much unusual about it in that time frame. If you were like me, and I'm wondering, and I was wondering, how did he know the donkey was there? How did he know the owner would let him use it? 
And now we do know this, this is a pretty familiar area to Jesus. He, he'd traveled there often, he'd spent many days there, he'd, he'd spent nights there, he had friends that lived there, you know, a few people that, like Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, right? So they, he knows the area of Bethany. Maybe he had seen the donkey before in the cult, but possibly, but maybe not, we don't, we don't know. He definitely knew this day. He knew there was a donkey there. And the next question is, how does he know the owner would be okay with him using it? I mean, can you imagine someone you don't know coming up to you and asking for the keys to your car? I mean, I know with certain cars, we'd be like, here, take it, right? But I mean, most of the time, that's not what our response is going to be. Most of the time, our response are like, oh, uh, no. You don't care if they tell you the Lord needs it or not, because it's not going, right? I mean, you're just like, no, 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 I'm not giving up my car. But the cultural background for this response and, and the willingness to allow the donkey to be taken is called angaria. And so you can look it up, but it's, it's where a dignitary would procure use of property for personal reasons. And that right extended even to rabbis in that time. So, so it wasn't uncommon that this would happen. So when, he, when the response is the Lord needs it, it was understood. And the request was not completely unusual. It's a little bit like imminent domain, but a little less permanent. It appears the disciples, though, then took on their own initiative that they would put their coats on the, the, the colt for Jesus to ride on. And, and their significance to this colt and, that it, and, and pointed out that, that it had never been ridden. And it's important to remember that it is a colt and a donkey and not a horse because if Jesus had ridden into Jerusalem on a horse, it would have been, more, it would have been a sign of aggression and probably of war. Instead, he rides in on a donkey, which is showing he comes in peace. And the fact that the donkey had never been written, the, the colt, parallels the kind of ancient rule that only animals that had not been used for ordinary purposes were appropriate for sacred purposes. Luke doesn't mention this, but Jesus riding a donkey definitely points to the fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9, which says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The people gathered for a parade. They had expectations. And those expectations were of a king who was going to ride in Jerusalem not to be crucified by week's end. But they had expected a deliverer, a Messiah who would finally deliver the Jewish people from the rule of Rome. And what can we take from this? We can take from this, and it's kind of your first feeling, follow Jesus' instructions. We may not always understand them, we may not always agree with them, but we should follow them. Even when maybe culture and things around us are telling us it is wrong, hold tight to Jesus' instructions. The people wanted war. Jesus wanted to bring peace. Brings us on as we go along in this, in this parade and and it says in verse 36, as he rode along, the crowds spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. So the disciples put their garments on the, the colt, and, and, and the people then start, the crowd start throwing their garments out on the road ahead of him. We know that in other passages that, are, that record these same events, that yes, people put palm branches down, they were waving palm branches, all that stuff, but, but Luke doesn't mention it. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. 
But some of the Pharisees among the crowds, the teacher rebuke your followers for saying things like that. He replied, if they keep quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. All of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along. Remember, there are people in this crowd, and the disciples in particular, but, but there are people in this crowd who have seen Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. Remember, he's making his, his parade beginning point is basically Bethany, and he's beginning to go from Bethany towards Jerusalem. He's going down the Mount of Olives, and he is leaving that place where Lazarus lived and now was alive again. And he's leaving that place and headed towards Jerusalem. And he's making his way down the Mount of Olives. And, and, and it's an amazing moment. And the people are beginning to think about and they're, and they're celebrating. Now, the disciples are leading the chorus. The, the disciples are leading the praise. They're the ones who are, 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 are instigating the worship and the praise of Jesus. They're the ones who start it, but the crowds follow along. And many had seen the miracles. Many realize that this is Jesus. He is the Messiah. And they're going to shout and sing. They know what they're doing at the moment. They just have the events of what is coming confused. They know Jesus is the Messiah. They've heard his teaching. They've seen his, they've seen his responses to the wisest people of their day. They are convinced that Jesus is the Messiah and is worthy of worship. On the other hand, the Pharisees are not so sure. In fact, they're convinced that Jesus' disciples were being blasphemous. And they instruct Jesus, tell your followers to stop saying things like that. What were they saying? Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. Now, notice Luke leaves out a word that we see all in all other places, I think. And that word is Hosanna. It sounds a lot like the angels announcing Jesus' birth. We look at that in Luke 2.13. It says, suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. The worship of Jesus on the road to Jerusalem is short-lived. The crowds turn against him pretty quickly. I mean, think about it. From Sunday to Friday, it... it, it and it really doesn't wait till Friday. It waits till about Thursday. I mean, the, the crowds change on him in a hurry. Public opinion goes south quick. Because they had different expectations. What we can take away is this. Give Jesus the worship he deserves. We, we, we have to praise him. We should continue to praise Him, even when life doesn't look like what we think it should. We should still worship Jesus. Give Jesus the worship He deserves in the good times and the tough times. Because He's worthy of our worship in every moment of our lives. There will be moments in life where it's tougher to worship. There will be moments in life where it's easier to worship. It will not always be easy. Just like it's not always easy to be a fan. And sometimes it's split in halves. Because <laughs> there were some KU fans that were not happy in the first half. And we thought our players were terrible. Notice I used the word we. What are they doing? I've never heard anybody say that at a sporting event. I've heard a lot worse, I can't repeat, but you just get the idea, right? I mean, you, 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 your, you, your fandom, even though you're, you're a fan, you get frustrated, and you turn quickly, they should get rid of that player, he's worthless. Life has a way of doing that, even 
through the walk with Jesus, difficulties come. Unmet expectations make it difficult at times to worship. And even in the midst of the difficulty, even in the midst of the moments where it's tougher, we must worship Jesus. Which brings us to the final thought, and we pick it up in verse 41, and and it says, "But but, but as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. But now it is too late, and peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. Yikes! Like, that's a tough moment. Like, we, we, we talk about the parade. We talk about the triumphal entry. I'm not sure what's triumphal about this, other than they're celebrating he was, but, but it changes fast. Jesus makes this pronouncement here. He, he makes this prophetic statement about what's going to happen to Jerusalem. And as Jesus makes his descent from the Mount of Olives, Toward Jerusalem, he's weeping over the city. Why? Because Jesus weeps over people who do not know him and do not follow him, who do not worship him. He weeps over that. And and especially in this case, these people had all the understanding they could have. They had the scriptures. They had everything they had. They had people who could have pointed them in the right direction. Jesus loves the people. Even those religious leaders who are calling what his disciples were doing blasphemous and telling them to stop. Jesus loved them. The problem with Jerusalem, the problem with the people of Jerusalem, the problem with the nation of Israel and the, and the, and, and the Jewish people at the time is they had continually rejected God and the Messiah. And it was a pattern of life, right? They would, they would come to the moment of judgment because of this. And it, it, it was this recurring theme in the history of the nation. They would forget God and experience judgment. They would return to God for a time and experience peace. There's so much in this moment that needs attention. And you know, you think about it, the signals that Jesus sends in the midst of all this would confuse at times the most educated in the scriptures. I mean, there's some part of us that can sympathize with the people of the day that missed all that was going on there. And we have to be careful to not make the same mistakes. Culturally, we're told in a lot of ways following Jesus is a mistake. I've seen it for years. I've seen people who have gone through disappointment, unmet expectations. And those things often lead to questions about who Jesus is. In the midst of all the chaos and confusion, it is important to come back to trusting Jesus. The people of that day who should have recognized Jesus rejected him. And Jesus prophesied judgment for those people. And and that fulfillment of that prophecy is A.D. 70, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem by the Romans. Did Jesus want it to happen? No. If even they had even heard and repented and turned to Jesus, even after killing the Messiah, I'm sure God would have relented. He's done it before. And the choice still exists. The choice that they had was to choose peace or destruction. And we still get that same choice today. I think my recommendation is choose peace. We don't like this. We don't like the, I mean, like, I don't know how many people would read this and go, wow, that's exciting. 
You, when you read this, we don't like it. There's something about it that we struggle with. We wrestle with the fact that God will bring judgment on a, on a people. In fact, we, we often hear it and we say, oh my goodness, like, how, how, how could that happen? But, but if you study the parables leading up, the parables that Jesus tells leading up to this, you begin to see this pattern. He's sending warning. He, he's communicating warning to the people. He's telling them, look, you must repent. You must turn. There's coming a day of judgment. And I don't get to make up the rules. I, I don't get to determine all this stuff. It, 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 you read the scriptures and you see it and you, you read and you have to be honest with that. But no one likes judgment there are times that even as a parent as you, 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 or anybody who's leading and different things whether it's parent work whatever where you have to make some hard decisions and you have to bring discipline and those things are not always easy to follow through but they're important to be handled correctly and it's hard for our culture to handle this passage of scripture. It's hard to handle any judgment factor within the scriptures because the immediate thought is how can a loving God do something like that? The simple answer is he's giving everyone a choice and every person gets to choose. He isn't forcing anyone to follow Jesus. He, he didn't force anyone then. He won't force his own people to follow Jesus. And he's not going to force anybody to do it. Look, this parade day, though, look, people could have made other decisions. Things could have been different. But we know where this parade day ends. This parade day ends with Jesus going in, he goes to the temple, and he, he just clears it out. And we're going to talk about that, but he clears the temple, and, he, and his words there are, my, my house should be called a house of prayer. And again, the money changes, all this stuff, he just, the, you know, the whole thing. And so he, he goes in, and then he leaves. That's what he, that's what he does. He just walks in, clears the temple, and he's like, I'm out. I'm going back to Bethany for the night. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting thought. But, but when you think about it, Jesus knows exactly what he's doing, and he comes in, he comes to Jerusalem with that moment of a parade, with people celebrating who he is, but knowing that that parade is an opportunity for peace. He entered knowing exactly where he was headed. He was walking down the path that God had marked out for him. And if he hadn't, there would be no hope for peace for us. Jesus' willingness to die for all of our sins and the sins of the world it is what brings us peace. And he should be praised for that. So this morning, I, we're going to have a moment where we close and we're going to sing another song. It's going to be an opportunity for us to stand and sing and worship. There's going to be a, a time for us to, to, to pray. And, and if you want to pray at your seat or whatever, you can. If you want somebody to pray with you, I know Ed and Sherry will be over there and you can you can. They'll join with you in prayer for whatever's going on. But look, the greatest choice that we ever can make in all of our lives is to follow Christ. And, and, and the choice here is, is really simple, yet very powerful, and at the same time very difficult. Because we need to understand that as we make the decision to follow Jesus, it's not just kind of this mental ascent thing. It is what Pastor Joshua was talking about earlier. It is a surrender of who we are. It's a surrender of our, uh, our desires into the conformity and plans of what God wants. It, it's, it's a saying, Lord, I trust you enough that you died for me. I don't understand it all, but I'm going to trust you. It, it, it's saying that, that like, like where I'm at today, I, I have plans, ideas of what I'm doing and all those things, but, but I'm giving you the rest of my life. I'm giving you my life to follow you. To, I'm going to surrender to you. Whatever you want to do with me, you, you do it. And that's important. 
following Jesus, yes, it's about following Jesus. It, it's about surrendering our lives to him. It's about saying, it, it's not just about escaping judgment. That's part of it. That's an end result. But the reality of it is, look, we got to come into this and go, I'm going to follow Jesus. Like, I'm going to surrender my life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what he wants me to do. Does that mean everything in your life is going to change? Well, no, not necessarily. Your, your, your job may not change. Your, your things you're doing may not change, but they might. And we've got to be okay with that. We've got to be okay with God is willing to, to, to use us and to speak to our lives and to, to go through it. Remember, you can trust him just like the disciples did. He told them, where to go, what to get, and what to say. He'll do the same for you and I. He'll tell us where to go, what to get, and what to say. Because he's that good. In every situation, if we'll trust him, if we'll listen to him, in the toughest situation you ever find yourself in, if you just listen, if you'll just trust him, he will tell you where to go, what to get, and what to say. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you, God, for this time. Lord, I pray for anyone in this room who's, who's maybe never made the decision to follow you. Lord, I ask today that that would be the case. Lord, that there would be some who would just, in this moment, in this, in, in this brief time, they would say, Lord, I surrender to you. Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for all of our sins. Thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for my sin. And Lord, I surrender my life to you afresh. God, would you do that in all of our lives, that we would make this a, a moment of surrender, a, another time in our lives where we just recommit to you, Lord, that we're surrendering our lives to you and saying, Lord, do what you want in us and through us. And Lord, that we will give you the praise that you deserve, not just on Sunday, but every day of our lives. Lord, when we give an opportunity, we will speak the words of life and praise to those around us. Lord, use us, I pray, to make you known in the world that we live in. God, in the places we go, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the places that we have influence, Lord, use us to make a difference, to make you known. And Lord, bring life and peace into the places Lord, I thank you for it. Lord, I pray that you would have your way in these closing moments. In Jesus' name.